So I'm just in my um, seventh year in the district, and I think this is my fifth year in this role, and I think I know you guys pretty well, because I told everyone would start at 810. <laughs> and service starts at 8, but the presentation started at 810, and that's fine. We hope everyone got a chance to get a cup of coffee and uh, a pastry that is provided by our amazing food service department, and if you didn't get one yet, certainly get one before you head out to your next session. Um, I just want to take a moment and welcome everybody to InService. Um, thank you for being here on this freezing, freezing cold day. Um, one of the things I always think about when I'm in Howe is I think it was maybe my first in-service day as assistant superintendent, and we were here in the summer, and it was like 4,000 degrees in here, <laughs> for those of you who remember. So a lot of things have changed since then. Um, one of the big things that has changed um, is that we now have maker spaces in all seven of our elementary schools, and we're very excited about that. Um, you know, also something that's always changing is technology and how we can use technology to engage students in learning. And so we have an opportunity today to learn more about both of those things. I hope you were able to find sessions that, um, that spoke to you, it met your needs, or something that you would be interested to learn about. Um, and so uh, we're excited for this day to get started. Just a couple of uh, procedural things to begin with. We are only doing one sign-in, so I will ask to make sure that you sign in on the, at the table in the morning, um, and that will take care of Act, Act 48 for the whole day. However, I will also tell you that we did give the presenters a list of everybody that registered for their session so that they knew, know who to expect. If you have not signed up for sessions, you need to go to the presenters table after this and check in with one of the principals so we can figure out where to put you. We do have a number of sessions that are full, we also have some sessions that are designated specifically for certain people. So um, some of our departments are doing uh, technology that's uh, specific around their area. Um, we've got some people that are doing a Mimeo board pilot, so there's a session for them and so forth. So you cannot just you know jockey around and slip into where you need to go. If you don't have a schedule, please see one of us so we can look at what's available and try to put something together that will meet your needs. Um, of course, no day like this is ever possible without the work and efforts of a lot of people. So um, I want to start by talking about the most important people that, um, that make this day possible, and those are the presenters. Um, we are lucky to have two, um, two guest presenters from outside the district, and you'll hear a little bit more about them in a minute. Um, but we also have a number of your own colleagues who have worked very hard to, to come up with uh, to some ideas and things that they're doing in their classroom or experiences that they have to share with them. And so I just want to take a moment and recognize all of those folks in the district who are giving of their time to um, help the professional development of everybody. Thank you very much. There are even a couple of people among you, and I won't name names, um, that are presenting every single session, which I think is amazing. So a special shout out to those folks. Um, I also need to thank the principals, of course, um, and all their work behind the scenes to help get uh, everything organized. And that in particular goes to, of course, Dr. Murray, who is becoming a professional hoster of these events. Um, for the principal's lunch, we even have flowers on the table. <laughs> I'm giving you comp time. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, uh, we, we're always ha happy to come to HAL, and we also thank the HAL teachers because we know we do disrupt your lives a little bit sometimes when we're using your rooms to, to present and you come back and all your furniture's rearranged or something. So um, thanks again for hosting. Um, uh, Chris Stingle and uh, his tech staff that make everything go so smoothly in terms of the scheduling, being able to use the Sketch app to register, um, Everything works, the, the PowerPoints, the, you know, whatever, the, the Wi-Fi, um, and all of the work behind the scenes he did to help organize the speakers for the technology, and thank you, Chris. Um, and, uh, of course, again, the, the tech staff who are always here and willing to help and are also doing a number of our sessions, thanks to all those people. How about a round of applause for everyone for their work? Let's back, get back to today. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, the person who's going to introduce our keynote speakers. I think many of you may know her, or if you don't know her, um, you certainly know of her. Um, Noelle Conover is the person um, who her and her husband David are responsible for our maker spaces. Um, and I think she prefers to be known as Matt's mom. So uh, Noelle, would you please come up and tell us about who's going to be speaking with us today?
Well, it's like coming home. And when you get to be a certain age, you look out and you know a lot of people in the audience. And so I know all the foster people over here and I know the how people over here and I see a lot of great um, familiar faces. Thank you for allowing me to come here this morning. Um, I didn't know, I mean, you guys in the district are really good about um, spreading the story of Matt, and I didn't know if everybody in the room knows how Matt's Makerspace started. Can I show, can you give me a show of hands if you know the story of how it started? Wow, you guys are doing an amazing job. For those of you that don't know, I always like to start with the story of how it started because I always want to give credit to where credit is due. And um, the man who did help us start it is looking like right straight there, and that would be Jason Ramsey um, at Foster. And I always give Jason credit because I have to tell you, um, in life, you just never know what's going to happen. And I never dreamed in a million years that Matt's Makerspace would happen to us. Um, you know, Matt's been gone almost uh, 17 years. Um, but it always starts with just a small idea. And that's what happened. Um, our family, our last child graduated. She was a senior at Mount Lebanon. And we decided that we really wanted to give back to this community because this community just took care of us. Um, when Matt was sick, those guys over there at Foster just wrapped themselves around us. And um, it just, it really, it, it was the reason why we were able to keep going on. And so, you know, all these years later, we said, how can we thank the district? Because, you know, our last child went through, they all did great. It's a really great school district. And so we went to visit Jason because everybody's like, well, go visit the principal of Foster. He'll give you some ideas. And we thought we were going to come out of that meeting with him saying, you know, we could use a really nice big screen TV on that back wall. Um, we came out of that meeting with Jason saying to us, do you know what makerspaces are? And that was two and a half years ago. I think that was the fall of 2016. And we didn't. We didn't know what makerspaces were. We, we had no idea. Um, but fast forward, and now we do. And two and a half years later, Matt's Makerspace is its own entity. We're a nonprofit. We're going around um, changing kids' lives. And that, we think, is what Matt would really want us to do. And so for that, I'm always grateful to give credit to Jason for planting that little seed in our, in our, um, uh, in our minds and, and helping us to grow it. So it's really about that story. I just want to share with you the vision of Matt's Makerspace. You know, I never got up in the morning and said, today I'd like to start a nonprofit. Um, we had a pretty full life. I have a full-time job at Children's Hospital. It wasn't really on my radar, but it was a nonprofit that started us. And the, the beauty of it is a lot of our board is from Mount Lebanon. A lot of our teachers that are in this room are on the, on the board. Michelle's on the board, Bridget. Um, it, it, it's become a Mount Lebanon story. And our vision and our mission is growing. Um, and so we are currently working on our 11th and our 12th makerspace seven in Mount Lebanon, one at Children's Hospital, um, a programming, um, a yearly programming at Mount Lebanon Library. We have a preschool now. Um, St. Paul's Episcopal Nursery School is doing makerspace, and they have a Matt's makerspace. So when those kids start coming to kindergarten, they're going to say, hey, you guys have a makerspace too, which is really exciting. But what's really exciting is our next two makerspaces are going into Title I schools where 100% of the kids are on the federal lunch program. I couldn't believe that. You know, I had the fortune to grow up here in Mount Lebanon. I went to, to Markham. I got to, to live in this community. And then we always talk about, I think, is it 9%? Is that our number here in Mount Lebanon on the federal lunch? But when you go somewhere where 100% of these kids are on the program, and then you meet teachers, these teachers in these districts are just like you guys but they don't have the resources that we have. And I go in there and I tour these schools and I just wanna give every school a makerspace. And so we're really excited that um, this quarter we're opening up two makerspaces, one in Newcastle School District and one in the Yawk School District. And Newcastle had the opportunity to come here to Mount Lebanon and visit the makerspace. Or no, it was Yawk, I'm sorry, I switched them. And what's exciting about that is two years ago, we were learning about makerspaces and we were trying to visit schools and figure it out. And now you guys have figured it out and your program is so successful. I'm so proud of all of you teachers because you're what makes it. You know, we can throw these makerspaces in anywhere. We can bring in 3D printers and we throw them in the corner. But if without you guys to light up these kids' faces and their eyes, it's nothing. And so I'm excited to know that these new, this next group of teachers who really has no resources are going to be able to put these in the, into their schools. 
So Michelle and I <clears throat> have formed what we call the Noelle and Michelle Show, or the Michelle and Noelle Show, and we've been going around and speaking about this story. And it, the reason why is this story really connects with people, because it's a story not about makerspaces, not about stuff. It's a story about a community who cared about a family, and a family who got back up on their feet, and a family who gave back to the community. So that's a great story. And Michelle and I had the opportunity this summer to go to California, of all places. I mean, we got into this conference as far away from Pittsburgh as we could. And we went to California. We were so excited, both of us, first time in wine country. And we go to the conference. <laughs> oh, I wasn't supposed to say that, right? <laughs> Sorry. Hey, what's the most, what's the, I go around and I tell everybody about the makerspaces, and I tell them what the number one most collected thing is in Mount Lebanon's makerspaces. Wine corks, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we, <clears throat> we went to California, and you never expect in California to have somebody walk by in a, in a breakout session, and you see the name tag hanging down, and you see Pittsburgh. Well, being a Pittsburgher that I am, I even have my Pittsburgh colors on today, I had to run after him and say, where are you from? And I saw that he was from Winchester Thurston, but he had a, a, on his tag, it said, design to make a difference. And we started talking. I looked at his name tag, and I said, Marks, Marks, M-A-R-X. I said, that's such an unusual spelling of your name. I said, my husband worked many years ago at his company with a man named Frank Marks. And he got a big grin on his face, and he said, that's my dad. Well, after I picked myself up, because the last time I saw him, he was like uh, eight years old and running like a banshee through our company picnic, I said, that's you, oh my gosh, to, to meet all the way in California. Well, he invited us to his session, and he and David were presenting Design to Make a Difference. They were presenting their um, 3D session, and Michelle and I, to say the least, we were blown away by these guys. I was so excited because um, my husband's always worked as an engineer at, at ANSYS and they do 3D modeling and they do um, these kinds of things. And to see that Greg, his dad used to work there and now look at him, he's like the second generation of this. It was so exciting. Designed to make a difference, I have to tell you, I go all around now and I speak about you guys. I mean, your ears have to be burning. But what they're doing is fabulous because if you have done anything with 3D printers, you know the kids are fascinated. Everybody's fascinated by the technology. But once you're beyond fascinated by the technology and you have those little things that you line up on your windowsill or you line up on your desk or whatever and they start collecting dust, you think, okay, there's got to be more to 3D printing than these little things that we're printing out. And these these guys have taken it to that level, and you're going to hear about that today. They are designing to make a difference. And what blew me away is, is when I went and visited them, and I saw what their kids at Winchester Thurston are doing with 3D printers. I mean, they have a kid that got a patent because his dad or his grandfather had Parkinson's. I may be changing the story a bit. His dad had Parkinson's, and he wanted to solve the problem of Parkinson's with a 3D printer. How do you solve that? Well, the problem that the dad was, or the grandfather was having, was whenever he would try to open his front door, his hand was shaking, and he couldn't get the key in the lock. And they said, well, make it better. How do you make it better? And they had a child, I mean, fifth grade? eighth grade, who designed something. It was a conical shaped thing that guided the key into the lock. Simple, right? But designing to make a difference. Using a 3D printer to change the life of somebody who has um, uh, Parkinson's. So when I hear those stories and when I see that, that makes me excited because <clears throat> that's really using technology to change lives. And that's what these guys are doing. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear them speak. I hope you're as excited as we were once we heard them speak. And I did want to make an announcement. When these guys come in <clears throat> to the school for 3D, they, they get the schools on board for their, um, uh, for their um, design to make a difference. Uh, they can enter a contest. And these guys bring printers. And they have a 3D printer that they love, that they've used. Um, and, and, and these guys decided that instead of taking the honorarium or whatever you call it when you bring them in to pay them for in-service, they decided that they would take that and give it back to the school in the form of three 3D printers. And then they challenged me and Matt's Makerspace to finish that gift. And so we're announcing today that every school in Mount Lebanon now will have a 3D printer, thanks to the, the two.
So it is my distinct honor to introduce to you this morning Greg Marks and David Pym. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to like present, right? Like that was good enough? Yeah. So we really wanted Noelle to end it because we knew that's like how good she is and then like to fall. So we're going to try to not be bad. <laughs> it will be way better in the classroom if you come to our session. So that's just a heads up. Um, yeah, so welcome. It is Tech Maker Day. That's what we're referring to it as. Um, and we're really excited to be here. Um, yeah, we'd like to tell our story a little bit, uh, as Noel already kind of uh, introduced us both, but we thought we'd introduce us uh, officially so you could uh, get a sense on who we are and what we, where we've come from. Uh, my name's Dave Pym. Uh, I've been teaching for 23 years, uh, mainly in middle school, but I have uh, taught uh, in elementary uh, at the two uh, schools that I've been in. I spent 11 years at community day school, uh, private Jewish day school in Squirrel Hill. And now I am now 12, 12 years at Winchester Thurston. So it feels like just yesterday I walked into Winchester Thurston, and now I'm there longer than I was at Community Day. So it's a, a really interesting, uh, you know, to, to see where your career goes and where we are. Uh, I have worn many hats in my uh, my uh, uh, career. Uh, I've been uh, from a teacher to the tech director to the ed tech director to the coordinator. Uh, we know we have lots of names. I know there's probably tech people in here. Uh, we have lots of names for what we call ourselves. But I have uh, been in the closet, uh, you know, untangling wires. To, uh, to using all the technology, getting it working. I've done all that as well. Uh, I'm also an advisor, a coach, and uh, my, my biggest role, uh, a parent, I have uh, a fifth grader and a ninth grader at Winchester Thurston that I'm super proud to, to, to see them at school and, and grow with them. Uh, and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, my, my name's Greg Marks. This is my 15th year teaching. Um, I spent six at a public school, Blairsville, it's out in Indiana County, um, and then transitioned to Winchester Thurston. I've been there for nine years. Um, it's the sixth year that I've been the science department chair, and then the fifth year as the STEM and research coordinator. I don't know, even know what that means, so it shouldn't mean much to you either. Um, but I've taught like the super traditional strict classes like AP chemistry. Um, also, I've taught a lot of project-based classes where it's, it's like super messy and you don't know what to expect, um, like in a makerspace. Um, so I kind of have seen a little bit of everything. Um, and that is a picture of me from my first day of teaching. I like turned the corner and someone snapped a picture. Um, and this is early on in Dave's career as well. And I, I mean, I think we still look pretty good. Right. I think I age better. Okay. We don't have bells at our school. That was weird. Uh, okay, so I always first like to talk about like why Maker Ed. We always think about every like two or three years, it seems like it's every like two or three months, something new happens and you have to do it, right? At our school, we have like nine initiatives at once and no one ever knows what to do. Like, did we stop doing one? Are we still doing one? Um, so <laughs> it's, it, it's everywhere? Okay, good. This changed my career, um, finding this technology, finding students who are interested, giving the, give, being given the freedom to explore it. I'm not kidding, absolutely changed my career. I wasn't quite ready for like burnout, but I was close. Um, things that I think are important about um, maker education, they never ask, when am I going to use this? Right? It's the most important and annoying question to have a student ask you, because if they do not see the relevance, they're not engaged. In fact, they're probably not paying attention because they don't think they're ever going to use it. And you can't say on the test. Um, in my AP chemistry class, that's exactly what I say, right? That is the relevance, and they just come to accept it. But in a maker ed class, the reason you need to know this is it's going to solve the next problem, right? We refer to that as the know as you go mentality. Um, they rarely ask that question because it's obvious to them why they are being taught certain skills or why you're covering certain material. Um, and that engagement is there all the time. Um, all the time. Yeah. It's still, they're still kids, right? It's, it's still real life, so. Um, and then for me, it is, it's problem solving at its finest. I think to see kids creatively think and critically think, um, working together with other students 
is it the best solution to the problem? Maybe not, right? But, but they are tackling those problems. Um, and they're not doing it with like, okay, step one, highlight your variables. Step two, it's not, the, it, it's them thinking, not being told how to think. Um, the last thing, or not the last thing, excuse me, next thing is I think those, those assessments that we give, I've been writing tests for 15 years. I, I think they're okay, but I still don't know um, because I write them, right? I'm also the one that grades them. I decide how many points something's worth. I decide, is that worth one point? Is that worth partial credit? So it is, it's highly subjective. Even if you use a rubric, you're the one that came up with the point values. So this idea of seeing a student communicate their work to you and how they made this thing or how it works or what went into solving problems, you don't even need the test. You know what they've learned, they want to tell you. Um, but what they want to tell you even more of is where they made mistakes. Uh, this is my favorite part of maker education. Failure is needed, right? Failure are the things we celebrate. Um, we have kids at the end of the year present work and they hardly ever tell you what worked, right? And you'll see this Parkinson's key assist coming up and people are like, oh, that's nice. And the kid will be like, no, 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 I don't think you understand. This is like the 20th model of this, and let me tell you how like, much effort and energy it took to get this thing done. Um, and all of these mistakes I made that led to new knowledge, right? So my AP class, if you miss three, those are three things you don't know. Uh, in my Maker Ed style class, those are the three things I need to figure out to solve the problem. So it almost becomes motivation, not punishment. Um, and then you'll start to see it I mean, it is amazing the, how inclusive this is, um, the diversity that we have. If you do it right, it isn't just a bunch of white males in a robotics program, it's not. And we hope to showcase that as well. So these are the first things I've ever done in terms of 3D printing. And I started back in 2012. We got in really early. And I am grateful that my school had the funds, had the resources, had the trust in me to let me do this but they didn't the first year. We'd outsource all our parts to be 3D printed. Super expensive. So this is one of the first things we ever made. It might be really loud, I might mute it. Yeah, I am gonna mute it. Technology. It's pretty much what you would see on the screen there. So those are, those are wind turbines. We picked an engineering project. I didn't really let the kids have much choice in what we did. I have them, let them have choice in what they made. And we repurposed the computer fan and made these wind turbines about this big. We spent more money than it cost to buy a 3D printer getting the parts out to us. But at the end, I convinced the school that, hey, this is something that was awesome, that the kids were into, and that we should pursue. Um, so the idea there was using uh, a motor and turned it into a generator. So there's like a ton of STEM in there. This is the second year. You're my technology guy, Dave. Okay, um, we'll see if it pops up in a second. So, when we had the 3D printer, they were a meter by a meter by a meter. That was the requirement. So they were like significantly taller. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's worth seeing. Um, and when we were doing it the first time, we weren't able to go through that iterative process. It was one and done, it either worked or it didn't. So there was a lot from that maker movement that we couldn't do because we didn't have the equipment. As soon as we had the equipment, we were able to fail a lot. And these are some of the final projects. And again, we'll see if it pops up. If not, it's not that big of a deal. I can show it maybe in the sessions. But the wind turbines were massive. And the one that you saw in the first time produced right around two volts. And these were producing upwards of like 25 to 30 volts. So just to see in one year, just from a little bit of practice, you, you get the hang of it, you get better at it, and, and the kids learn from it. I'm gonna go ahead and move on, not a big deal. So I'd like to, to transfer over to, to, to middle school, uh, tell a quick story that I tell a lot. Um, the time frame there, uh, 2012, 2013, Greg started diving into 3D printing. Uh, at that time, I was diving into uh, changing over uh, our computer program in our middle school from more of an ed tech program to a, a CS program. Uh, we've now uh, changed Winchester Thurston from a, a, you know, just a, a ed tech across the board. We're now a K-12 uh, computer science school uh, where we teach computer science all the way through. And I have a couple sessions later, I'll talk a little bit about the computer science aspect of that. But, but as I was doing that, 
that one day Greg walked into my uh, computer lab in the middle school holding a 3D printer, dropped it on the table and said, I want you to run with this for a month. Figure it out, uh, see what you want to do with it, see if, see if you think it's viable uh, in our middle school. Uh, since that day, I now have uh, what we would consider our maker space in the middle school, uh, what, what we call our rapid lab, where I have uh, seven 3D printers. Uh, we have a middle school that CAD models across the board. Uh, everybody in middle school does, does get to use the 3D printer. And uh, from that day, I, I never gave that one back to him. Uh, he didn't get that back in a month. I, I think he thought he might get it back and he had to go buy more. And that's, that's, that, that, that's what, really what happened. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure, and Greg talked a lot about uh, how it changes your career. This really changed my career. Uh, I'm a little older than Greg, uh, so not that I was getting burnt out, but it was, what's the next thing? What, what's the next step uh, that we can teach? That I, what's that? You wanted to do. That I wanted to do, yes. What's the next step that I want to do as an educator? And uh, 3D printing really you know, gave me that spark. Uh, it really is an exciting technology. And uh, I'd like to show a little bit about what we've done uh, in that early stages with, with some of the design uh, to show you what, what we're doing with the students. Uh, up on the, the screen right now is my first design. Uh, I'm proud of this. I have them printed. In fact, I have the actual first print that I made, and it's terrible. It's all warped and stuff because I hadn't quite figured out how to use the 3D printer and level and do all that. Uh, but what I made is a, an iPhone speaker, an acoustic iPhone speaker. Uh, this took me probably five hours to design, took about 10 hours to print. I walked in on, on Monday morning, and Greg, when you get to know him, he gets excited real easy over things. And I showed him this, and he was like, he, I think he knew right away that this printer is never coming back. This is, this is what we're going to do. Uh, and and, and I, we ran with this. Uh, different ideas uh, for the middle school. Show you some of the different things that we do. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more very into tying uh, technology in the curriculum. I don't want to have just technology sitting in a room. Uh, we're a one-to-one -one Chromebook program in our middle school, so we have a lot of technology. We're, we're, we're excited about that. But I want to be able to use it and, and make sure that we uh, you know, don't just have it sitting in the corner. I think, I think too many times we, we buy something technology-wise and it just doesn't get used. This one I wanted to use and we got excited about it right away. Uh, do, do, do we do connected math uh, at, at, at Mount Lebanon? Does anybody know that? Have you heard of connected math? Well, Great, great. Well, the, the, on the right here, the, little, uh, the little, little guy with a face there, that's called a mugwump. I had a student walk into my, my room uh, really weeks after I got the 3D printer and said, uh, we were in our book and they talked about a 3D printer and I told my teacher, you have a 3D printer in your room now, can we do a project with that? And what this is, it's called a mugwump and what, it, what they do is uh, they take that, that, that uh, figure and they, they do scale modeling with that. Well, before 3D printing, they just did that on graph paper. You draw the figure, do coordinates, and, and scale model that down. Well, this is exactly what 3D printers do. So I built the Mugwump in a 3D printing program, taught all our kids how to CAD model, and that is now uh, a staple in our math curriculum for our sixth graders every year. So every one of our sixth graders in this class is getting a CAD modeling lesson on how to CAD model that down. And we actually then print each one, and you can imagine, that's actually a pretty large one. We actually will print that to a 1 12th scale and uh, two of my students said, well, maybe these could be earrings or a little pin. And uh, they actually take something, make something out. We do some artwork with that, too. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, the other two pieces there, too, things kids came up with. Uh, we do a, a middle school musical every year. Uh, we sell, sell little trinkets for the musical. A couple years ago, we did uh, uh, Schoolhouse Rock Junior. The kids made, designed little uh, what we call break a leg. Uh, key chains that you buy those, they give them to the actors, make a little fundraising for the, for the play. That's what that Schoolhouse Rock is. Uh, the, the bottom one is exactly what you think that is, it's a guitar pick. Uh, the music classes learn how to play guitar in uh, sixth, seventh grade. Uh, so they design guitar picks, their personalized guitar pick, and that's one of those as well. We actually gave this away at one of our benefits at, at, uh, at Winchester as well, as we went forward. Uh, lastly, a couple other things on here. Uh, uh, the, the top right uh, is, a, is a license plate. Uh, that's my go-to project in our summer camps. I teach 3D modeling to uh, uh, third through fifth graders in summer camp at Winchester Thurston. And some of you probably have had kids or, or, or heard of our summer camps, they're pretty well known. Uh, I do a tech time camp where we, we teach 3D printing and CAD modeling. And I love to do uh, things that the kids can take away. Because there's, if, if there's one thing that, that, that I hope you'll see this excitement today, I've been 3D printing for years and years now. 
I CAD model something, hit print on the printer, and I still get excited when you hold that print in your hand. And when the kids can do that, that process, it's really exciting too. Uh, down to the bottom, I, 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 I have that on there. We have a 3D scanner. That is me. That's a 3D scanned head of me. Uh, and, and it wasn't just, just to have that sitting on our windowsill, like we said. Uh, I had a student come to me in one of my uh, elective classes that uh, they, they, the students can, can think of a problem or think of something they want to build. Uh, this student wanted to make a whack a teacher game. <laughs> Uh, the one thing you'll find out from Greg and I, we very rarely say no to a student, uh, but we, they have to have some kind of idea on what they want, what they want to do. He wanted to incorporate some uh, Arduino, some, some CS, along with some 3D printing. What he developed was we, we scanned five teachers, and just like the whack-a-mole game at Kennywood, you hit the, when the light comes on, you hit the teacher on the top of the head, and uh, they score a point. He had to connect to his computer. Uh, he won some awards with that as we, uh, as we did that throw showcase. It was good. <laughs> And, and a couple of teachers' heads fell off, so they, it, was, it, was, it was good. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, on a serious note too, uh, that was a very therapeutic day for me. I, I, I talked about uh, uh, being at the Jewish Day School for, for 10 years. I, I grew as a professional that day. Uh, so the events uh, on October 27th really hit hard. Uh, this was, uh, uh, Greg came to me and said, I'm surprised you haven't 3D printed that sign. And uh, I, went to, I went to it and uh, did it. Uh, we have these hanging in a, a number of classrooms at school. Uh, and I like to say that it was, it was, it was what I needed the week uh, after that. And a lot of our community did too. Uh, so, so even th 3D printing can be that therapeutic uh, side to it as well. Uh, to move forward, you saw a lot of things up on that screen that are uh, a lot of fun, a lot of uh, are great design and great design work. But what we wanted to do, and what Greg and I uh, really, our next level to this was, we wanted to take uh, what we do with a 3D printer and really connect it to what our credo of our school is. And our credo of our school is think also of the comforts and rights of others. Uh, and uh, this goes back to the, the 125 year plus uh, uh, history of Winchester Thurston. Uh, I took a few pictures. Uh, our credo hangs all through our school. We have awards based around our credo. Uh, it, it, it's in our social contract in our middle school. Our lower school recited every day at their morning meetings. Uh, it's hanging on the walls. This bottom uh, right-hand one is the head of school's office. It's right up on his wall. That, that's meaningful. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure the work we do with our curriculum and 3D printing connects to that credo. And I think you're going to see that as we go through some of the next slides uh, to see where that stands. Okay. So, so how do we transition from making like cool wind turbines, right? Because I still have to teach the kids STEM. Um, we still have to make sure we hit all of these skill sets. We still have to make sure that it aligns with the curriculum. But then how do we like transition to this idea of thinking also the comforts and rights of others. So I teach this project-based class where you see these two girls presenting at the end of the year. It's our version of a science fair. We call it a showcase. That's a Winchester thing. Um, it's okay. And the only requirement in my class is that you make a product that helps people. So that's what I say on day one. That's it. No syllabus. No, like here's what's expected. Here's the five things you must turn in. That's it. And then we hit the ground running. So well, the kids, since this is ingrained in them, they still need help, they still need guided, but a lot of them are already thinking this way. They are thinking about social justice, they are thinking about their neighbors, they're thinking about their community. Because what you need to remember is, we don't have a home community. There is no Winchester Thurston School District, right? We pull from other schools, districts and you're gonna see where this led to design to make a difference a little bit later, right? But they very well know that there's really not much of a difference between them and their neighbor, right? Maybe there's a difference between what their parents make and what their neighbors make, and they can afford to send them to our school. But in terms of their community, where they live, who they are, they're very similar to everybody else. So if they can help other communities in need, then they are using kind of like, I mean, we do, we have a lot of privilege. We have a lot of excess, we have a lot of resources. So why wouldn't we want to not be like a charity? Like we're not, do not think of people like charity, like, oh, we must help you because we can, or here we come to save the day, right? We try to ingrain in these students that it's the right thing to do. And if you can lead your life in that nature, then you're gonna grow up to be, to, to be a good person, hopefully. So that's where we kind of transition. And just to give you an example, that is a mat for someone who tore their ACL 
And if you could not afford to go to like physical therapy or you couldn't drive to the physical therapist or get a ride to the physical therapist, this invention would allow the th physical therapist to let you take this home and it helps you do squats. You can do squats like in the, with bad technique and that could actually hurt your knee. But through research, they found out that it's the number one exercise for people who have suffered an ACL tear um, for physical therapy. So if you do the squat correctly, the little uh, like white clear little rectangles light up either green if you're doing it right, yellow if you're close, or red if you're doing it incorrectly. And then in the colored foot pads are sensors to see where the weight of your feet are. And then she's wearing a knee brace and that detects how far your knees are together. So they programmed this, built it with 3D printing and other technology. And the idea there was, again, somebody could use this if they couldn't afford to get to those places. Um, both of those girls were athletes and they both suffered ACL injuries. And they knew kind of how lucky they were, how much you know, resources they had and that they were able to, to access that. Um, there's a little up close version of it. This is the most recent project the group's working on. That's an alum. She elected to have both of her legs amputated below the knee because she had like a degenerative foot disease. So eventually she would need it. So she just said, I'm gonna have them both so that I can figure out how to live um, without it, not wait for it to occur. She was a swimmer, a competitive swimmer. And that was one of her forms of exercise. She can't swim anymore. She tries, but she wants to be able to swim. So she actually approached us not bragging. A lot of people know what we do and they come to us with like problems and they want us to help solve them, right? It's been a couple years. Um, do we always do well? No. But in this case, there's a group of girls who are like really creative and really good. And one's a competitive swimmer. She's not pictured in this, but we figured we can tackle this. So we are designing her swim prosthetics. And there are the girls interviewing her, taking measurements of her residual limbs. And then there is a close up of kind of what we're working on. That scanning technology that's really cool to scan your head is also really cool to scan residual limbs. So again, we're trying to take what's fun, what's interesting and apply it to how we can help other people. They're like really close to getting this done already, um, which, is, which is nuts. Um, like we're gonna go to a pool and watch her swim with it. It's gonna be awesome, I can't wait. This is how everything got started though. This was one of the first groups that came to me and on day one they said, we're gonna cure diarrhea. <laughs> I said, you're gonna walk back over to that table and you're gonna rethink a way to present this. <laughs> Cause although at the time, I think what, 36, I, I will laugh at you. Cause I have the sense of humor of a 15 year old still. So they came back and they said, cholera is the number one killer in developing nations. I said, okay, this is a little better. But you don't die from the disease, you die from the symptoms. And the symptom was diarrhea. You get dehydrated. And the kids are really good, they know us, and they know how to like play us. So they set you up to answer their own questions. Right, you have kids, they have diarrhea, what do you give them? What do you give them? Pedialyte, very good, Pedialyte right away. What's wrong with Pedialyte? The shelf life's like what, you open it, you have like 48 hours. It's heavy, it's expensive. How are you gonna ship Pedialyte? Right? And then, again, classic. Why don't you give them Gatorade? Too much salt and sugar. It actually makes the symptoms worse. So they were leading me to the research that they did for me to understand the problem. The, the like, best practices is to take a palm full of sugar and a pinch of salt and mix it with water. Anybody's palm is the same. Like, I have a heavy pinch of salt, my wife says, when I cook. So again, how do you make the right solution? But that's what they were doing in places like Uganda where a lot of their research came from. So they said, we can come up with a product that does this. We're gonna make the best, worst graduated cylinder you've ever seen. It's gonna measure two things, sugar and salt for a specific bottle. And they did research to show like the most common bottle over there was like one liter or one and a half liters. It's a weird shaped bottle. So they made this tube and you fill it up to the line with sugar and then you top it off with salt and then you dump it in a bottle of water and shake it up. And they have like scientific evidence that's like legit and statistically sound that shows that it works. Uh, the cool thing is that's them in Uganda last summer. Yeah, like, yes. Not me saying, hey, why don't we go to Uganda? No, all on them. They're just awesome, right? Two of the best chem kids I've ever had. But again, they live in neighborhoods where kids just like them that go to different schools. They're everywhere. 
Um, so the tubes went twice to Uganda. Once they went by themselves, and then last summer they took them back. And then, literally last week, this is their 17th model. Just the tube. Fill up to sugar on one side, dump it in, flip it over, fill it up with salt on the other side, dump it in, done. So they're sophomores in college now, still working on it, trying to start like a nonprofit, trying to start a company, trying to get funding. Just awesome, right? So that's the kind of stuff that makes me want to get up and go to work every day. It's also the stuff where they ask a question, I say, I don't know. Let's figure it out, right? In my AP chemistry class, if your hand goes up, I tell you to put it down because I know exactly what the question is and I have the answer out before your hand goes down. And that's not fun. Yeah. As you can imagine, too, uh, just to jump back real quick, uh, Jacob over here uh, on the left, uh, I was walking through our school last night to pick up some of the equipment for the day. Or, yeah, uh, yeah there's a plaques on the wall of awards that our seniors uh, I get every year. Uh, one is based on our credo thing, also of the comforts and rights of others. And you can imagine Jacob won uh, the award uh, his senior year for that. Uh, Jack won, I think, three others. So that's probably why he didn't get it as well. Uh, uh, amazing kids. I got to coach them, teach them through middle school as well. So to see this makes me proud as well. Uh, uh, I, I don't have much to say about this. Uh, Noel talked about this, and I appreciate this. Thank you, Noel. Uh, no, I, I, I love this. This, this is the Parkinson's key assist. It is that simple, and I have some models uh, in the room. Uh, come see it. Uh, it really was that uh, my, my students wanted to figure out a way uh, to help uh, somebody that had Parkinson's. And you figure out with Parkinson's, the, the shaking, uh, trying to put a key in a, a door. Uh, they actually modeled this off the doorknobs in our school, but it could easily be modeled on any doorknob uh, out there. Uh, and that's what they were really looking at, at doing. Uh, but it's a real simple device. Uh, the, 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 the left-hand side goes uh, on the actual doorknob. The other side just fits on that little ridge. And the key is like a funnel right in to it and you twist it and uh, it really is about as simple as you get uh, but they did go about 30 iterations into this figuring out how to line things up uh, how the funnel would be uh, at first they were they were using a bevel tool to cut out the hole then they they, they did it in 3d printing uh, they uh, presented this at the Pittsburgh Regional Science Fair and then actually presented it at our uh, design to make a different showcase that I'm going to talk about right now uh, because this is what we want them to do. This is designed to make a difference, helping people and, and figuring out something for their, for, uh, 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 to, to help people in their, in their lives. Uh, this is done in my elective class. Greg and I each teach a class uh, that, that's geared towards this. Greg has a full-blown academic class in our upper school. Uh, I have an elective in our middle school where the kids come with these problems and uh, we don't say no very often. We might laugh at them a little bit and get them through that, but uh, we let them kind of roll with it. it really, and you see what, what they present, it's really great. Uh, let's get to design to make a difference. This is where we are now, and this is, this is how we uh, were fortunate enough to meet Noel in California, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Greg came to me uh, again, uh, not with a 3D printer, because I had too many of them already, but he walked into my room and said, uh, there's not a competition out there for our kids for 3D printing. We, are, uh, we, we, we go to the Pittsburgh Regional Science Fair a good bit, uh, uh, from middle school up through high school. Our, our kids do quite well there. Uh, but the one lacking piece at that uh, competition uh, is there's not a lot for this 3D printing uh, type design element, uh, that engineering element. It's starting to get there, but it's not quite there yet. And Greg and I wanted to, to, to enter some of our kids into that. We couldn't find one we liked. We're pretty particular. Uh, in fact, I don't think there was one out there. So he said, let's, let's just design it. Uh, this is what I do. I don't say no very often to Greg. He walks in the room, we, we go, and we roll with it. Uh, we're pretty busy individuals, but uh, this was an important thing for us to do. Uh, so uh, we set out to create a 3D printing competition, uh, but what it turned into was a much different piece to us. Uh, as we've said here, uh, uh, we're quite lucky at Winchester Thurston. Uh, we have plenty of resources. We have students that can afford to be at our school. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that my kids go to our school, uh, you know, based on what the teachers get to, to send our kids to our school. Uh, we have a lot, and we have very privileged kids at our school. Uh, we wanted to find a way that we could turn that around and give back to schools that quite 
didn't have what we had, the resources we have. We have a program at our school called City is Our Campus. Uh, City is Our Campus, uh, those of you that know Winchester Thurston, we are a block from CMU. We are a block from the Cathedral of Learning, all the great hospitals in, uh, in the Oakland area, but not just that, just the, the city in general. We found years ago that our niche for Winchester Thurston was we are right there in all of that. So why not utilize the city to help our students become better individuals? Uh, and we've done that. We have a, a nationally recognized program that does that. Uh, but what Greg and I have, have said all along is that we're utilizing the city to help our students. We want our students to then, in turn, help the city. And that's what we're doing now with Design to Make a Difference. We are trying to uh, give back to schools that don't quite have these resources, teach them how to use 3D printing, showcase our products, uh, what our students are doing, and help them do that. Uh, Greg said it, I think, perfectly. Uh, the person next door to you might not make enough money, the same amount of money, and they don't go to Winchester, but they're the same person. They could design just like this, and we want them to be able to do that as well. And that's why we came up with Design to Make a Difference. So we'd like to highlight a little bit about what we've done the last couple of years with that. So just a couple of pictures. Jeez, sorry. Um, We've, we've had some really good partners, right? There's no way we could do something like this on our own. We've worked with the Children's Museum. We've worked with the Science Center. They've donated space, uh, help with equipment, help with PD. So this is one of our first ever PD events. We just met like 10 teachers. We had no idea who they were, and we, we were introducing them, just like we will to some of you today, to 3D printing, to Tinkercad. So we've done it a few times with people who like wanted to get involved, didn't have access, right? That's one of the big things for makerspaces. They were supposed to lower the achievement gap. Right? You had your non-test takers, here's a cool way for them to be able to show you what they know if you can afford the $9 million equipment. So you see all the schools that didn't need them had access to them because they could afford it and now all of a sudden the achievement gap got even bigger if you ask me. So we wanted to find those areas who were like-minded, who wanted to get involved and who were willing to just give it a shot. So that's one of our first PD days. It kind of spread throughout the summer. Here's us at a couple events. One STEM Fest, where we kind of worked with Noel again. And the other is one of the events at our, at our school, where it was like a national event. We brought people in to kind of spread the word. Why wouldn't you do this in your city? If we can do it here, you can do it there. Um, and then this is some of our most recent PD at the Children's Museum. So those are things that we printed on the spot that those people designed with this idea of how do I help others? Because our goal isn't to just preach it, but to try to get you to think that way as well, right? Because a lot of people say, what do you mean? Design parts to help people, right? So we try to go through this PD in a way to show you that, to help, you, to help guide you through that process. Um, and then I'll hit it real quick, but we're coming close to the time. Yeah. So this is, oh. Yeah, I go nuts. So this is Mohawk, and it's all three levels of Mohawk. It's high school, middle, and elementary. And they had to design a part and present it to us at the end of the school. We're going to throw a football. We'll talk about a guitar pick holder. We'll talk about just being able to throw a baseball. Because of the time and the machine that we had, we decided on paper football. That's something to do for recreation. So we came up with a few different ideas for holding the paper football yeah, to do the kick cool. and then our roll post here. Yeah. Uh, so very, uh, obviously a very small uh, section of a population would want something like this. Here. But really, uh, we, just, we took it away from something maybe useful in daily living to just something that would be Okay. Uh, we'll so we we got to assume somebody scored. All right, we'll be here all day. Stop back last year. I'm walking through. They're ready to go. <laughs> this is going to be a short uh, ball. Okay. He didn't have a maker space. He, a 3D he came back. He watched him play paper football. It's great. He stopped in just to see. He's on the tech team at Mohawk. Uh, does great, all the stuff, great stuff with technology. So we didn't talk about I said, go back and tell the teacher about it. Oh, it good! Was good. <laughs> 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 it was good. Uh, he went back, he went back to, uh, to Mohawk, told his teachers there, they're now part of the program. Actually, one of their teachers uh, does videos for our website. He's fantastic. Uh, and that's just that, that, that circle effect. That's what Pittsburgh is. We all know that. It's great. Uh, so... Yeah, that's how we started, right? We're in year two, and this is combined data from year one and two. We've worked with over 20 districts, private, public, and charter, uh, also including Western Pennsylvania School for Blind Children. Um, 
donated over 25 different, different the same printer, but 25 of them. Uh, we're right around 40 hours of PD. That'll go up to like 46 today, hopefully. Um, and then we've worked with a bunch of different partners. Um, we've been lucky enough, Winchester footed the bill the first year. Um, I don't know how that happened. There's a bunch of administrators who were leaving and like didn't care and just said, sure, we'll pay for it. We ran with it. It's great, right? But um, this year we have a, a grant from the Grable Foundation, right? So hopefully we can continue to sustain that. Um, but we've had over 35 teams and it's roughly 50-50 middle school, high school split, right? Diverse population, when you see the kids present, we, we, we want them to represent their school, but if you didn't, you'd have no idea where people are from. You'd have no idea who they were. All the projects were really high level. You couldn't tell a Mohawk project from a Winchester project, from a Northgate project. Um, and currently we have five elementary schools piloting the program, right? So that's where you're all sitting there thinking, and I know it, some of you are like, middle and high school, I'm teaching third graders. You're nuts until you meet Caden Taylor. Caden's a, at the time was a second grader at Deer Lakes. And we were working with the Deer Lakes Middle School and I was at their school and I was helping their team. They're having some issues with the machine and I live close by. So I had like the afternoon off and I drove up and I said, I'll meet with them. And they said, do you have time to meet with the second grader? I was like, second grader? My daughter's in first grade at the time and I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way, right? <laughs> And they're like, yeah, he has this really cool idea for a hanger. And again, I'm sitting there thinking, hanger, second grade, this is, this is going to be dumb. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go talk to the kid, right? Honest thought process. And that's Caden. That's Caden at our showcase where we gave him, like, this big, giant special award. Because Caden developed what he at the time called the big kid hanger. But now it's called the helper hanger for people in wheelchairs that can't reach a hanger. And he thought I could help and I could design a hanger that pulls down, you can hang up your coat, and it retracts. And it was genius. And the part that he has is made of a bunch of parts that you would find at Home Depot, used scissors and duct tape. There was no printing whatsoever. And he showcased how it worked. It was one of the best projects from anyone at the showcase. So again, is Caden an extreme? Um, no, I don't think he's an outlier. Right. Is he a little bit more advanced? Probably. But is he an outlier? No. Right. Deer Lakes, second grader, I would assume that is, a, that is a good average, depending on the district and the level of education and the resources that you have. So Caden won consulting, and I helped Caden model his parts to make it a little bit more refined so he could go and try to patent it. So he could go and try to get funding to get it made. And this, if it works, is my daughter who is now in second grade, who is now learning how to CAD model because I saw what Caden can do. Um, and I have it at my house. This is in my basement. So this is us testing it out. Oh, I probably just messed everything up, didn't I? <laughs> well, it's a minute and 32 seconds and half is me just talking. Dave. Oh, there it is, there it is. Right, so it's basically the uh, retractable key or retractable, but for janitors. He said, I was walking around, I saw my janitor that had like a thousand keys. <laughs> and I realized that one must be stronger. It's genius, right? It's research. <coughs> no! Okay, so I just built like a case for him to hold all those parts. And then we took apart a hanger and just tried to make it simple. Again, a little bit better than duct tape, um, but still a prototype. And then this is like my daughter's time to shine. And she definitely, yeah. Um, but it's just two 3D printed parts. Those parts came off a printer that is just like the ones we're donating to your school. <laughs> Nothing fancy about it. Um, that's her. She was so excited. Now, there's supposed to be some strings. There was a later model that helped you pull it down. Um, we were just working on that. And this is her, like, like she's never hung anything up. <laughs> and of course, I'm holding the phone. Up. Just put the hanger on. Come on, hang. There's my son yelling, the dog comes down. Come on. She just lets it go. Yeah, and she just lets it fly, right? It was awesome, right? So if you remember, this is in the summer. We started to think this could be this could be an elementary school. This easily could be an elementary school thing. Are you going to come up with similar ideas to some of the high school and middle school? 
no, but your kids are creative. They think of grandparents, cousins. They think of, they're the first to say, can I help you with that? This is natural to them. It's a natural fit, right? So we, we're, we're excited and we have a bunch of different middle schools. Mohawk, Deer Lakes, us, Shaler. Shaler. No. Yawk, and then hopefully some of you all. Yeah. Yeah, Mount Lebanon. Oh, is it Mellon? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but isn't she middle school? Middle school, yes. Yeah. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. She came to one of our trainings already. So that's what kind of ends it, right? And we actually thought Noel was going to swoop in right now and end everything. But I. I guess I'll finish it, right? It took us going to California to meet Noel, to have a similar story, to realize that we're all doing the same thing. And our goals are just to try to improve uh, everybody, right? And if we can get our kids to think like this, imagine when they get older, imagine when they get to middle and high school, imagine when they get to college, how they're gonna be thinking and what they're gonna wanna do. Um, I always end with, with, with something like that's politically charged, I do, right? I think if, if I am gonna argue with you about a tax plan, it, but we both agree that helping people is vitally important. I think we can pretty much have like a good argument, right? So again, we have these kids from all these different areas and they're gonna grow up. Imagine if what they're thinking about first and foremost is how do I help the people in my community? I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat or anywhere in the middle, I don't. Like, you're gonna be a good person. Yeah. Thank you.